But there's a sign-in sheet going around. Do please sign it. Um, also, just to let you know, there are a couple of dates in April where the talks have been rescheduled. One um, has been rescheduled to later in May, and the other one will be, has been rescheduled for the fall. Um, so that will come out in the email that I send out next week. But just to be aware, there are a couple of April dates for um, the seminar series will be canceled. Um, so basically today uh, we have Elsha Pienaar who's going to um, – talk to us about formulating multi-scale hybrid models to describe um, tuberculosis infection. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for allowing me to talk today. Um, I'm not sure where this would be best. Okay, so um, like Marcy just said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about multi-scale hybrid models. So not really one topic, lots of different topics, and then I'll talk to you about how we um, integrate and connect these different models to address multi-scale biological questions. Um, so first, before I get into the modeling bits, a little bit of detail or background about tuberculosis. It's um, a global health, public health <coughs> problem. There's about 9 million new cases every year, um, about 1.5 million deaths every year, and it's believed that one out of every three people is actually latently infected with TB, meaning that you have the bacteria in your lungs, but um, you're don't have any symptoms. And so this is just the WHO's map of um, TB incidence, and you can see that it's not very equally distributed. Lots of high incidences in sub-Saharan Africa and in um, Eastern Europe. Um, so quickly about the disease, it's caused by infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, you inhale the bacteria and it seeds in your lungs. It's mainly a pulmonary disease, but it can um, spread to um, other parts of the body. Um, and symptoms include coughing, weight loss, fever, and night sweats. Um, so just going through the typical uh, infection progression, a certain uh, percentage of people will actually clear the infection. We're not sure um, what the steps or the, the um, progression is to be able to do that, but we do know that it happens. About 5 to 10 percent of people will progress to active TB disease, um, but the majority of people will develop this latent infection. Um, if you are latently infected, there's about a 10 percent lifetime risk of um, developing active TB, or what they call reactivation TB, um, but this percentage increases to about 10% yearly risk if you're HIV positive, although the majority of people will um, spend their whole lives call it kind of colonated by this bacteria um, without ever developing disease. And so like I said, the bacteria seed in your lungs and then they form these things called granulomas, and they're very um, structured, immunological um, kind of tumor-like structures. They have a casein, which is a necrotic tissue on the inside. It's surrounded by macrophages and then the, like a lymphocyte cuff mixed with macrophages around the outside. Um, these structures are very variable, they're dynamic, and they're very heterogeneous. And so this is where the bacteria lives um, during infection. Quickly about tuberculosis treatment. Um, a lot of the problems that arise with TB treatment is because of the long uh, treatment requirement. Typical treatment consists of six months. You take four antibiotics for two months and two more antibiotics for four months. And so compare this to your typical antibiotic regimen that takes you 10 days. This is a very long treatment. Um, and so this long treatment leads to people um, not taking their drugs. They take the drugs for a couple of weeks, they start to feel better, and then they stop. And so that led, this led to the WHO implementing DOTS, um, which means that you go to the clinic, somebody watch you take your drugs every day. Um, or as I do here in Michigan, the nurse will actually come to your home and um, watch you take your drugs there. But, um, so that helps the, the compliance problem. Um, overall, TB has pretty good treatment success, 86%, which is a good percentage, but um, because of the magnitude of the infected population, that still leaves about a million people without successful treatment every year. Um, and as you can see, again, there's a lot of variation by region um, uh, based on the treatment successes. So if we think a little bit about the scales of MTB infection, it goes from uh, molecular scales where cytokines and chemokines interact with host cells all the way up to population scale where people interact and infect each other. And so questions that arise from these multiple scales is why do we need such long treatment regimens? Why is TB so different than other pulmonary infections? Um, and also, we know a lot about these molecular mechanisms, and so the question is, um, which one of these mechanisms are driving um, infection outcomes at the population or at the host scale? And these kinds of questions are very difficult to answer. 
um, in experimental models, non-human primates are really the only animal model that reproduces the human-like pathology for TB. Um, and in vitro data captures little bits of information on individual molecular or cellular scales, but it doesn't give you a good overall idea. Um, and these um, lower scale mechanisms are very hard to study in vivo because you need enough um, sample to be able to analyze them. And so it makes it an ideal problem for computational methods to tackle. And so quickly an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about choosing model types to match your biological system, so the scale where you are, as well as matching the questions you want to answer. So you add as much detail as you need to be able to answer the question you have. Um, and then I'm just going to talk about a few different model types and then um, talk about them kind of with TB as an example, which is what we work on. And then finally, just a sensitivity analysis, which is an analysis tool for you to determine how sensitive your um, model outputs are to different parameters. So first, I'm going to start with agent-based models um, and um, how we use them to describe TB granuloma formation. And so the question we had here was um, which cellular level interactions drive the tissue scale outcomes. So what cellular mechanisms are important to form these, these um, immune structures called granulomas. And so for um, deciding which model we're going to use, uh, we need a model that allows individual host cells to act on their own and for us to then look at um, collective effects that they have at the tissue scale. You also need to be able to capture the variability in the biological system because all these granulomas are different, we need to have a stochastic component. Um, and as well, from uh, biological data, we know that the structural aspect of these granulomas are very important, and so we need a model that can capture that. And so the one that kind of checks all of these boxes is agent-based models. And so it works, uh, kind of connects the cellular and the tissue scale questions. OK, so a brief overview of agent-based models. They typically have three components. You have your environment, your agents, and rules. And so um, your agents are individual computational entities. And um, the rules are kind of based on their individual desires and beliefs. And you define that based on the system you're going to look at. These agents then uh, interact with the environment and make certain decisions about the action they're going to take. Um, their decisions are often based uh, used using probabilities. Um, and random number generators, and there's a lot of software packages available that has the structure for building these uh, agent-based models available, like NetLogo, um, where you can define your individual agents, but the structure for building these models is there. And it has a lot of applications <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, uh, in animal behavior, in human behavior, but also in, in cellular behavior, which is what we're going to look at. So this is our agent-based model. Um, we call it Grand Sim for granuloma simulation. Um, our environment uh, is a representative of lung tissue, and it's just a square two-dimensional grid where um, the agents move around and interact. Our agents are a um, bunch of different uh, immune cells, macrophages, um, in various stages of infection and activation, T cells, and the bacteria. And the rules are um, cellular interactions that is based in biology and in vitro data um, and so forth. And so we seed the simulation grid with a single infected macrophage in the center and then let the simulation run on its own and let the granuloma evolve. And so we get these kinds of granuloma um, formations as an emergent behavior of the system. And um, along the way, we also calibrate to non-human primate data. So we have collaborators that have the primate model for TB, <coughs> and they measure um, CFU per granuloma <coughs> or number of bacteria per granuloma. And so we use that data um, to calibrate our model too. And so here <coughs> is a little movie showing the granuloma. Um, this is really zoomed in. And so here is the outline of our simulated granuloma. The green cells are resting macrophages. Um, the blue ones are activated. Uh, here's a little pocket of infected macrophages, and this white stuff in the middle is the casein, that narcotic tissue that I talked about. And so this granuloma is about 40 days old. Um, and then if I run this, hopefully you can see it go all the way up to 150 days. And you can see the, infected, the infection kind of moving around the granuloma, as well as the casein expanding and um, getting more necrotic. And so the kinds of questions we can ask with this model um, is, for example, related to TNF-alpha-induced um, apoptosis. So one of the mechanisms built into the model is TNF-alpha in the granuloma causes um, host cells to apoptose, to die. 
And so um, since we have a computational model, we can knock out individual mechanisms and see what kind of tissue level effects it has. And so here, if you knock out the TNF-induced apoptosis, you get lots of cell infiltrates, you get lots of activated cells in blue. And if you knock out the TNF and TNF secretion as well as apoptosis, then you get a more contained granuloma. And so this shows that the TNF-induced apoptosis um, helps um, control inflammation. And so this is an example of how a cellular mechanism has tissue level effects and the model can, I can identify those. And so next we're going to move to ODEs, which most everybody should be familiar with. Um, and we use that to describe receptor ligand dynamics in our granuloma. And so going back to TNF-alpha, um, it's an inflammatory cytokine. It's been implicated in TB disease severity. And we've also identified, as I just showed you, it's an important factor in the granuloma development. And so um, our next question is, which molecular mechanisms drive TNF-alpha dynamics? So now we know this molecule is important. We want to ask more questions. And so we need to add more detail. And for this model choice, uh, we know that we need a model that can track a lot of species. And we know that we can assume that locally the components are well mixed. So every cell is in a grid compartment. And so it has access to the molecules in that grid compartment, which we can assume is well mixed. Um, and so therefore, we chose an ODE model for this. And here's just a schematic of the TNF-alpha dynamics. As you can see, it's very complex. There's two different receptors, um, membrane bound and soluble TNF. There's a lot going on. And so we built this ODE model. And so every set of differential equations represents one single cell. And so now we have to put, connect this ODE model to the ABM model. And um, here's just an example of uh, information exchange between the models. So um, here's our simulation grid. There's a, a, a host cell agent right there. And it has this system of ODEs operating inside of every agent. And so um, for every single agent in our simulation grid, you've solved their ODEs for their specific properties and location. Um, we determine the properties, like for instance, A or B, which represents TNF-alpha, and then make agent-based decisions on their um, local environment. And so these ODEs send information to the agent, which makes a, makes a decision and then has a certain behavior. And some of the predictions that came out of this is um, there's an internalization rate for each of these receptors. And um, what this model was able to show is that the internalization rate is a major driver of TNF dynamics. And so if you see here is increasing internalization gives you increasing number of bacteria. Um, and you see that down here, too. You see lots of inflammation if there's no, no um, internalization and lots of bacteria if there's uh, high internalization. So we were able to answer molecular scale questions using this uh, multi-scale Ransom <coughs> And so finally, uh, we use partial differential equations to um, calculate molecule diffusion and distribution on the grid. Um, the question here is, what are the spatial distributions, and does it uh, con contribute to the infection outcome? Um, <coughs> we needed a model with spatial and temporal dimensions and that can track distributions in a discretized grid that represents a continuous distribution of, of molecules. And so um, now we have three components. We have an agent based, an ordinary differential, and a partial differential equation model. And so the PDEs track the distribution of molecules, which feeds into the ODEs, which gives your agent a, de a decision, which plays out on the cellular scale. And agent movements, again, affect their, their ODE states, which uh, uh, secretes or degrades um, molecules, which again updates the molecule distribution on the grid. So there's a continuous feedback between all of these models. Um, and so the predictions using the PDEs is that we see the um, sharp gradients for TNF, more diffuse gradients for antibiotic in the granuloma, because these molecules are much smaller, and so they diffuse a lot, quickly, a lot more quickly. And so next, <clears throat> I'll talk about the sensitivity analysis tool, which we call LHS-PRCC. Um, and so basically, you have your model that has n parameters and r outputs, and you want to know how sensitive are the different outputs to each one of the parameters. What you can do is vary each parameter. So sample parameter 1, you look at it effect, its effect on the outcomes, and they do the same thing for all the other parameters. But the problem here is that uh, parameter number 1 might have a completely different effect in, in different, uh, for different values of the other um, n minus 1 parameters. And so really, you need to vary all these parameters at once. 
And so what we do is we use Latin hypercube sampling, or LHS, uh, which is a method to um, thoroughly and equally sample the parameter ranges. We vary all of these parameters at once, and then calculate their uh, partial rank correlation coefficients with each one of the outputs. And so that way you get an idea of the parameter's influence on the output in the context of all of the, all, all of the other parameters as well. And so here is a fun table to not look at. Um, <coughs> So this is just a sensitivity analysis of the, the ODE PDE Granson model that I just showed you for antibiotic treatment. So here we have a bunch of different parameters, and here we have uh, treatment outcomes like uh, total bacteria, time to clearance. Um, and so we see that the host parameters are important for untreated granulomas, but they continue to be important in treated granulomas, saying that the host continues to play a role even during treatment. So um, next we're going to move to uh, a little bit more detailed model of the bacterium itself. And so just a little bit of background on the bacterium. Um, it grows inside macrophages. It can slow or stop its growth when it's stressed under hypoxic conditions or low pH. And those are conditions that we know exist in the granuloma. Um, when they slow their growth, they start to accumulate lipid inclusions, which is just um, fatty acid uh, kind of bubbles that accumulate inside the bacteria. Um, they uh, change their uh, metabolism when they're inside host cells. So there's a metabolism, a metabolite exchange between the host cell and the bacterium. Uh, we know that fatty acids are a, a major carbon source um, in host cells. And we also know from uh, recent single cell experiments that uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in, uh, in the bacterial population. So, so these are all things that we want to build into our agent-based model to be able to probe the roles of all of these different uh, qualities on the tissue scale outcomes for the granuloma. So that's kind of what I just said. We want to look at the nutrient environment, the granuloma, and how it affects um, bacterial phenotypes. Um, and so the model choice here kind of has two components. First of all, we want to capture the bacterial variation, so we need to build bacteria into the model as agents whereas before they were um, continuous variables represented on the grid. And some of the second part, we want a model that has metabolic detail and um, few parameters, because if you think about a metabolic network, you guys know that there's a lot of metabolites and, and reactions, and we don't want to have to fit parameters for all of those. And so flux balance models are a good um, way to capture a big metabolic network without all of the rate parameters. And so we'll do the individual bacteria first and then the flux balance model. So first tracking individual bacteria, now we uh, build the, the bacteria as agents and define their rules. If your nutrient conditions are good enough, then you get bigger. If your size is bigger than a division threshold, then turn into two bacteria. If it's lower than cell threshold, you die. And if you're near a host cell, you can be phagocytosis with a certain probable <coughs> Um, we also give the bacteria, uh, the bacterial agents, uh, certain properties. For example, we give them a biomass to be able to track how big they are, and we track how much uh, lipid inclusions they have, because these uh, lipid inclusions can act as carbon sources under uh, carbon-starved conditions. And so now we need this model to, to translate um, these properties into growth rates, and that's what the flux balance is for. And so a quick overview of flux balance models is first of all, you need to define the metabolic network, which that is a feat in its own, and luckily other people have done it. And so for MTB, uh, we end up with about 700 reactions and 650 different uh, metabolites. And the next step is to put your um, metabolic network into a stoichiometry matrix as well as your constraints. And our constraints here are um, oxygen levels, fatty acid levels, pretty much available nutrients. Um, and then finally, you define your objective function. For most FDA cases, um, people use biomass as an objective function, and that just says the bacteria will grow as fast as it can always, which we know is not the case for TB. And so what we do is we make a linear combination of biomass and lipid inclusion production, saying that um, under high oxygen conditions, the bug will grow as fast as it can, but when the oxygen starts to drop, the bug will start to deprioritize biomass production and start producing lipid bodies instead. Um, and so the final step is just to use linear programming to find the optimal flux, the maximum flux through your metabolic network into your objective function. 
Um, and so this is just to show that we include the nutrients on the simulation grid. So we have oxygen gradients and fatty acids. Fatty acids are deposited when host cells die because um, we know that the calcium kind of like, consists of dead cell debris. And so the information exchange between the agent-based model and the flux balance model, um, for every bacterium, we take its nutrient and phenotype information and feed it into the flux balance model, which then uh, does the optimization and predicts a growth rate and lipid accumulation rate. And so we do this for every bacterium in the model, which is computationally, even though FBA or FBM in the scheme of metabolic models is fast, um, this is a lot of computation to do when you have thousands of bacteria and tens of thousands of time steps. Um, it takes a lot of time. So what we do instead is make lookup tables. And so we use the five inputs and the six outputs of the flux balance model. And um, we build uh, big lookup tables using the NPA and we build this table once. And so now every time we want to determine how fast the bug is growing, we just go to the lookup table and use multi-dimensional layer interpolation to be able to, to estimate the growth rates. Um, and so this final model has the host component, it has nutrients built in, and um, it has pathogen detail built in. So now what can we do with it? Um, the nice thing about this is that we have inter information for individual bacteria. So we can look at distributions and variations between bacteria. And so what I'm showing here is the distribution and relative frequency of bacteria according to their generation times or the time between their last divisions. And so longer generation times means slower growth. And as you can see, for later days during infection, the generation times keep getting longer and longer. So these bacteria are progressively slowing their growth. Um, although you do get a pretty wide range of generation times. And so we can also ask, what are the instantaneous uh, growth rates that drive these generation times? Because a well, generation time could be a function of many different growth rates throughout the bacteria's lifetime. And so we see a wide range of growth rates, even at early time points where the generation times are short, there are some bacteria that are not growing very quickly. Um, and so... Go back to Next. So do they actually observe, are there observed um, cases of mycobacterium dividing that fast? Like you've got things at three days between when um, yeah, well, the <clears throat> MTB's typical generation time is about 18 to 24 hours, which is really slow already by bacterial standards. Um, but yes, um, they do see, there was one study, it's really hard to measure growth rates in vivo because you just can't get enough samples to be able to do those kinds of estimations. But these are all within um, previously seen growth rates in vitro and in vivo, for, as far as we can um, and so if these are the kind of growth distributions that we're seeing, we can also go one step further and say, okay, well, what are the nutrient conditions driving these kinds of growth factors? Because you can get a slow-growing bug for a bunch of different reasons. Um, and so now what we can do here is just an example granuloma at different time points as it's evolving. We can take bacteria from all of these time points, pull them together, and then um, cluster them based on their available uh, nutrient conditions. So we're saying, um, of all these bacteria, what kind of nutrient conditions are they seeing? And so if we cluster them this way, we see that here in oxygen, there's a big division um, based on available oxygen. And then we can take it one step further and start to characterize um, these clusters that we just made. Um, these color codes are just showing the different clusters. And so um, here's the panel that I just showed you for clustering, and then this is another panel, just a heat map panel, showing characterization of these clusters. And so the first thing, if you look at the time point, remember I put four time points together, is that the time points really cluster pretty close together, except for day 100 and 200. And so that suggests that the major nutrient changes are happening over time rather than spatially. Um, we can also look at some specific um, growth characteristics. So if we look at their effective growth rate, in the early time point, there's two groups, one that grows pretty quickly and another one that grows slowly. And if we look back at the available nutrients, we see that this slow growth is due to limited um, carbon sources. And so if I go back a little bit, um, you can see that there's high bacterial loads in the center of that granuloma, and so there's big bacterial expansion without a supply of carbon sources from host cell death at that early time point. And so that's why um, these bacteria are growing slowly. We can also see uh, the switch from effective growth rate 
uh, from growth to lipid inclusion production somewhere between day 60 and 100. Um, and that is due to the hypoxia stress response um, under the low oxygen conditions. And so the other thing we can do is take these clusters um, that I've color coded here and map them back to locations in the granuloma. And so this dark blue cluster, this slow growing one that I just showed you, you can see that they're all in the center of the granuloma where there's high competition for nutri nutrients. And you can see again that the, the cluster is the colors change more over time. You don't see a lot of variation within a single granuloma. Again, saying that the, the major changes are over time. And so just kind of to summarize the, the bacterial part of this, um, there's a range of nutrient conditions over space and time with the major changes happening over time, and there can be multiple kinds of slow-growing bacteria depending on different limiting factors. Um, and so just kind of an overall summary, um, we need hybrid and multi-scale models to be able to capture biological systems that happen at different scales. Um, it needs to be hybrid because that way you can match the model type to the questions you want to ask and get the most information. And it needs to be multi-scale because Biology is multi-scale. And so I'd just like to thank uh, my lab members and our collaborators that did a lot of the flux balance models at Johns Hopkins. And I'd be happy to take any questions. And that's something that we're planning to look at is, um, so, for these kinds of growth distributions, um, can we connect the bacterial distribution to some granuloma characteristic? And so um, we would do another sensitivity analysis for that, um, in which we would vary <coughs> the host parameters and then look at the different bacterial outcomes. And so then your parameters would be things like TNF secretion rates or rates of apoptosis and stuff like that. And then we can track um, the changes in bacteria. That's something that, that we're planning to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's so much data in here that it's almost hard to, to get a good handle on it. So. Mm -hmm. so at one at the bottom level, you went and generated a lookup table. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of cascade that and you fill that in and like the next level, can you also do a, generate a lookup table so that you can, I just want to know if you can eventually pre, essentially pre-calculate a lot of the ranges of things and mm -hmm. represent them as probability. So you mean at the different scales yeah. of the model? Yes. And that's something that um, Denise and Jennifer, my advisors, talk a lot about what they call um, tunable resolution is you turn the detail on and off as you need it. So for the ODE TNF model that I showed you, the question there was about TNF receptor dynamics, and so you need to have all that detail. But you can also fit a much simpler ODE model, be essentially a model reduction for that whole system. So when I want to look at bacterial dynamics, I don't necessarily need to know how the TNF happens. I just need to know that it happens. So I can turn that detail off, kind of coarse grain it, and then, and then look. So it's not a lookup table, but it's kind of similar. It's a coarse grain. Um, so just out of curiosity about the bacteria, uh, the, you mentioned that it has a lot of heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Does it come from a higher mutational rate or is it the way it replicates and maybe incorporates other DNA or something in there? So you're hitting on an important question that there is phenotypic and genotypic variability right. in MTV and what I showed here is all phenotypic. So it's just regulatory responses to the nutrient environment. We haven't added the mutational aspect to it. It's something that we hope to look at because different lineages of TB have different mutation rates. And so they think that that is a big factor in uh, drug resistance development because um, the, of course, the higher mutation rate strains would develop resistance at a higher rate. And so this is all phenotypic. There's no genotypic changes. But it's an important thing to look at. So uh, does um, so does this um, kind of behavior that you looked at does it uh, <clears throat> work well with the uh, pres the prescribed uh, intervention that you described because you said there are four antibiotics and then there's a switch mm -hmm. after four months so is that in relation with any change drastic changes you are seeing in behavior? Um, so the way that the treatment regimens are designed is very very empirical. And so um, 
that switch is based on early bactericidal activity studies that people did earlier, assuming that most of the bacteria will be killed in those first two months. And then you just need a continuation phase to kill off those last few months. Um, so no, the treatment is not based on any sort of bacterial analysis because people just don't know. Um, but uh, some of the antibiotic results that I showed you, it's we're trying to build more and more antibiotics into the model so we can try to address these questions. Um, what would be a better regimen? What are the bacteria that are surviving for six months? Why do you need such a long treatment? Thank you very much.